I'll start, Emma. Great, go ahead. Okay, so hello and welcome everyone to the Be Waste Wise webinar of the month. I'm Akanksha Singh. I'm the community builder at Be Waste Wise. And as most of you all know, that Be Waste Wise is a non-profit organization which grows around, uh, I mean, the work uh, principles of dialogue and diversity, addressing the need for knowledge dissemination on waste management since uh, 2013. Uh, we are very proud and happy to announce that this year we are celebrating our 10th anniversary and we are celebrating a decade of bridging the waste solution expertise gap worldwide. We started off with one moderator and today we have uh, more than 12 uh, moderators who are coming from different parts of the world and society and they're posing questions and teasing out insights and guiding conversations that are more relevant to us uh, than any other online or offline platform. We have more than 300 contributors as well who are taking part in this journey and uh, having these conversations and waste dialogues every month. Uh, and we are happy to also let you know that on our 10th anniversary, Be Waste Wise has uh, revamped its website, giving you easier access to the tools and information you need with improved navigation and user experience. We encourage you all to check out our website and explore many such waste uh, dialogues that we have been generating every month. Uh, moving on to this discussion today, we have our very eminent and learned moderator, uh, Emma Burlow. Most of all, you would have seen Emma moderating our webinars uh, for many years together. She's the founder of Lighthouse Sustainability, and she's uh, one of UK's leading specialists on circular economy and has worked with businesses on sustainability for more than uh, 25 years now. After amazing response and interest on our first uh, webinar just a few months back on repair and reuse. Today, Emma is back with the second edition of uh, repair and reuse series, this time for the large electrical appliances. And today she is going to talk to a very power packed panel, Andrew Mullen from uh, Beko PLC and Belinda Chellingworth from, uh, she's a CE specialist from Australia. And we have uh, Sarah Ottaway as well from uh, Suez uh, Renew Hub uh, from Greater Manchester. With this panel, uh, Emma will be looking into a very holistic approach and will understand how we are actually making any progress in the reuse and repair of large electrical appliances, uh, you know, in the current scenario. Before I proceed further, I would request you all to know that this webinar will be recorded and will be uploaded on our website and on our uh, YouTube uh, channel. Please use the Q&A function for all your questions to the panel. And we would also request you all to please use the chat function for your comments or any suggestions or opinions and to connect with each other uh, using this function. You can also connect with our uh, panelists. They'll be sending across or they'll be sharing their LinkedIn profiles over this. And you can uh, later on also connect with them uh, on a personal level. Uh, back to the panel and back to the topic, Emma. I'm not going to hold much. Over to you. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. What a lovely welcome. Uh, and welcome, everybody. We're over 60, uh, nearly 60 people here. And I can see uh, some some new um, new attendees from countries we've never had before. So Myanmar, uh, welcome. Uh, welcome from the States. Uh, obviously, we've got a couple of people from Australia as well here. So I'm really pleased to see that. So um, I'm not going to spend too long. I'm Emma Berlo. Um, as Akanksha said, I'm founder of Lighthouse Sustainability. But I'm uh, here today to host this panel. Um, really, we're asking, like, are we making progress? I'm looking at this from an external point of view, and I'm saying, you know, what is what is taking us so long on this? Uh, so we're going to hopefully be quite challenging. And I know some of you that came to the first webinar, um, you know, had lots of questions. So we just felt it was uh, worthwhile doing another one and actually trying to push a bit further. So I've invited Sarah from the waste industry. I've invited Andrew back from the manufacturing space, and I've, I've invited Belinda, who's uh, based in Australia, uh, to come at this from a more uh, consultancy point of view. She sees this from, you know, several different angles. Um, just to kick us off, can I just ask my panel to give us a little quick 30 seconds on uh, where you sit in the reuse and repair world? Um, and uh, maybe, you know, where you see some of the biggest challenges that maybe we're going to uh, unveil later today. So, Belinda, can I come to you? 
Yes, hello everyone. I'm coming from a place you'd know um, as Sydney, Australia. I would also like to acknowledge Mount Gadigal land. They're the traditional owners from where I'm speaking. Uh, it's such a pleasure to see so many people from around the world joining. Um, we're quite removed, I think, down here sometimes. So I'm a circular economy um, consultant. I've worked within local government, um, large businesses, and not-for-profit as well um, in the UK and also in Australia. Um, so I come at this, I think, from a very sort of broad perspective um, and I do a lot of work with the community as well. So I think some of those cultural issues are the ones that are very interesting to me. Perfect. Thanks, Belle. Great. Sarah? Yeah, I didn't press my unmute button quick enough. Yeah, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, lovely to be here. So, yeah, I work for Sewage Recycling Recovery here in the UK. So we uh, we look after collection services from households um, all across the UK, uh, and we also manage household waste recycling centres, um, which are kind of places where we can capture items before they end up uh, and make sure we put them to best use from local communities. Uh, reuse is something we've been doing for over 10 years. Um, I've been very much involved in that throughout that time. I opened our first reuse shop um, and we now run 30 of them all across the UK. Um, in 2022, we made sure that uh, more than 400,000 items were put to reuse rather than uh, being recycled or disposed of. And repair is something we've been doing specifically since 2017. We now have um, one of the UK's leading uh, reuse and repair centres in Greater Manchester Region, our Renew Hub. Um, that's a 6,000 square foot space that uh, deals with repair, including large electrical appliances, which is one of the reasons that Emma invited us on today. We very much see reuse and repair is a central part to the circular economy and very much where we need to be headed in terms of how we use items we no longer want. And uh, that's, that's exactly for today. Sarah. And I got your note about the tech. So if we if we I'll lose Sarah, she'll be back. Yeah. Andrew. Oh. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name's Andrew Mullen. Um, I work for Beko. Um, um, nice to be back. Um, uh, I think, you know, look, for, for me, I started my time in the industry. I've always worked for big manufacturers. I've always worked for global multinationals. For some, I know that might be a bit like working for the enemy, but but I've always worked for, for big companies across the world. And I started my career more than 35 years ago. Um, and a lot of that has been in after sales and service and quality. And when I first started, um, a lot of my time was spent working with independent service companies because there was a thriving repair business uh, industry in the UK of independent companies repairing stuff. Um, but over time, technology has moved on, production has moved on, pricing has moved on. And so these days we're we're in a very different world. And in some ways, it's very good. You know, when I first started, CD was only just taking off. There was no solid state audio communicate with the factories in the far east via fax um these days it's very different and so the industry has to adapt and is adapting um and and mainly we're here to listen um to see what people think mm, good that's great to hear andrew um and and thanks for coming back and also thanks to andrew we had quite a lot of engagement post uh, webinar the last time we ran this so it's obviously a hot topic it's obviously something people want to talk about um Akanksha, can we run the first poll to just see what people think um i'm going to ask the question what is holding progress of repair of large appliances back what's holding us back what's stopping us so hopefully you can all see that poll now and we'll just kick off uh with a conversation around this I hear this, and Belle, you might, from different perspectives. Uh, Andrew, you will hear it from a manufacturer's and a, maybe a consumer's perspective. Belle, you may hear it from a com community perspective. Um, I sort of sit in the middle and hear everybody uh, bemoaning the kind of challenge that is repair. So access accessibility, local repair is coming out really high there, nearly 50, 60% of responses. But actually, look, across the piece, Cost is high, manufacturer support, skill shortages. Let's keep going, got 48 responses so far. But access is coming up quite high. And we can talk about that. A little family anecdote, my mum uh, rang um, 
Hoover, who uh, she has a tumble dryer from Hoover. She rang them and they diagnosed her fault over the phone. She now thinks they are the best thing since sliced bread, Angie. Uh, so no, you know, in terms of access, that was great. Great uh, for her. She probably wouldn't have gone online to do that. She's of an age uh, that phoning them up and getting um, some help over the phone was great. So 51, if anyone else wants to pop a response in there, go ahead, 53. But it's definitely looking like accessibility to local repair is coming out the highest with 55% of responses, followed really closely um, by cost, which I'm sure we will touch on, uh, manufacturer support and skills. Um, Andrew, I think I'll come straight to you. What's your thoughts on that? those responses? Um I guess they're all the things I'd expect to see, and and there, the the point is, or the fact is that there is a number of, of of challenges for consumers, and I think consumer appetite scores fairly lowly. But I I think you know, it's not necessarily there isn't a consumer appetite, but I think what there is, is, um, consumer concern about how you get a repair that is is both cost effective and safe. Uh, and reliable and that probably feeds into a lot of the others um and you know there is there is no doubt that certainly in the uk and in other parts of of the world there are much fewer independent repairs out there manufacturers do do their own repairs and do offer their own repairs but some some consumers think that the manufacturer is likely to be the most expensive option and so i think for for us you know, offering consumers things like a fixed price repair, whatever the cost of that repair is, or, or whatever the fault with the, that appliance is, clearly helps. Um, and consumers will know that if they go to a, uh, a the manufacturer, then they'll it'll be a trained engineer. They'll use um, uh, the proper parts, um, uh, and it will come with uh, a guarantee. But mm. outside that, it's really difficult. Much as it is in many industries. Um, to find somebody who is competent and reliable and who won't charge you an amount of money to come out to look at your product just to go, well, that's not worth repairing. Um, and for, for many people, it just becomes an easier option to replace the appliance. Mm, so touching on the cost there, Andrew, which, you know, access to local repair. And obviously, if it's not local, it might well cost you more and all the rest of it. Um, and the skills are all wrapped into that. Right. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, which it's almost like, where do we start? It seems like quite a complicated um, puzzle to solve. Interesting on here, safety concerns, which you've mentioned, Andrew, already today, comes out the lowest. Um, and also appetite comes out the lowest. So I'm really interested to sort of dig, dig a little bit more into this. Are we trying to solve a problem here that consumers don't even want? Or, or what are we saying is the appetite is there, the demand is there, and we don't need to worry about it. Uh, but Belinda, do you want, what are you seeing in Australia from the sort of consumer appetite point of view? Yeah, you that know, it's funny you, bring, it's funny you bring that up because I was thinking this morning, you know, sometimes we get in our, our little echo chambers and we end up talking to people who are quite like-minded and the scientist in me Honestly, um, after some conversations I had this morning with audiences that I probably wouldn't ordinarily engage with, was thinking, you know what, there'd be people out there who wouldn't even know what repair is. It wouldn't even, you know, come to them as a as an option or um, even into the realm of consciousness. So putting that to one side, I think on the local, like having access to local repair, that's certainly something we all have these anecdotes from friends and family. Even I have two from last week alone wow. where two friends, uh, you know, one was a, a TV, a large TV. One was a fridge. They both wanted to um, get them repaired. They, they went to the, these are big brands, you know, they had gone to the company and said, oh, where can I get this repaired? And they said, find your authorised or authorised repairer. And then they sort of ended up on that hamster wheel you know, trying to find one. And one of them ended up driving 45 minutes across two bridges and Sydney siders don't like to cross bridges ever. <laughs> so it's a big deal. Right. Um, 
but drove 45 minutes, you know, yeah. to find someone who would repair it for them. And and I think, I know we're going to talk about cost, but mm. there's the sort of the out the upfront capital cost um, sometimes not being worth it compared with buying something new. But I think when people are really busy and they're, they're time poor, it's all of that, you know, yeah. resource and effort that he put into actually just finding this repairer in the first place. Um, and that's a massive, I think that's a huge barrier yeah. for people because if it's not accessible and it's not easy to find, then, yeah. you know, why bother? Yeah. So absolutely, and and a comment came in while we were doing the polls from James to say, you know, it's not exactly something that you can put in your handbag and wander down to the repair cafe with, right? So as soon as, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to focus on large appliances, because a lot has been talked about small appliances and repair cafes, and that's all booming, at least it is in the UK. Um, but this large appliance issue Arguably, there's a lot of carbon locked up in those devices. There's a lot of uh, circularity potential in those appliances. It seems like a sticking point to me. I'm glad Sarah's back because I know she's um, Sue is running the household recycling centres where people do turn up with large appliances. OK, um, so access then local, but actually more than local convenience and, and obviously access also means cost to people. So quite a lot wrapped up there. Um, James also says in the chat, not cost per se, but it's cost versus a new appliances. So the relative price of large appliances has become rel uh, ridiculously cheap um, in the last few years. Now, Andrew, I know this is something that you uh, quite often talk to in terms of how things are costed. Um, can we just talk about that for a minute? I mean, how do we solve this this conundrum around cost? We, we have to pay for labour to get things repaired. Yeah. Yeah. Any views on that? Andrew? Yeah. I, and I think, look, again, going back to um, perhaps when I first started for Beko, 2005, um, and I, I headed up the after sales operation. So um, at that point, um, a washing machine was probably in the UK in the region of £250. Um, the cost of an engineer to put an engineer on the customer's doorstep to go and fix it was about £30. Um, it's the cost of the spare parts. Um, and then there's the VAT on top of that, which at the time was 15%. Fast forward to now, the average cost of a washing machine is about £250. Engineer prices, if you can get an engineer, and, and engineers are, are getting increasingly mm -hmm. difficult to find, um, have gone up considerably. So an engineer now is 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 probably more like 50 or 60 pounds. Um, and then there's VAT on the top of that at 20 percent, not 15. So we've gone from a situation where the cost of a repair was about 15 to 20 percent of the cost of the product plus parts to a situation where the cost of a repair is a third or more of the cost of the product mm -hmm. plus parts and that pushes you towards a tipping point where people will look and think well is it worth it if i do get it repaired how much longer will it last am i just putting off the inevitable and in some cases they are and this is an issue that we don't ever really talk about which is everything has a finite life um and in some cases, perhaps it's not the right thing to get a repair, but consumers don't know that. And, and I think mm -hmm. the other thing is, and perhaps to use an example from, from my own life at the moment in a completely different situation, we're currently having our bathroom done. So we've got a local uh, plumber to come in and do our bathroom. Um, it started off as a really simple job, but the last local plumber mm -hmm. that we had in to do our bathroom has completely butchered it. Um, and that's the risk you take as a consumer mm. when you don't know, which is you look through and you you might rely on what friends say or, or recommendations, but ultimately you take a leap into the unknown. And for some people, it's just easier not to take that leap, leap and that risk mm. and to just opt to go for the new one because that comes with, with you know, assurances and guarantees. Well, even more so, it, it arrives on your doorstep the next day. Yeah. And, yeah. It, and it may well be interest free. Yeah. Right? So, so yeah, there, it's almost like there are there are moves uh, towards repair and then there are moves that would push you away uh, 
uh, maybe not intentionally, but from a pair. Um, Sarah's back with us, and I, I'm really glad because I just wanted to come with you to you, Sarah, about this affordability issue. So in the poll, access to local repair came out really high. Now, I don't know the stats, Sarah, but how far how far should people have to go to get to a household recycling centre? And do you find access with large appliances a barrier? Yeah, we we certainly see less uh, arriving at a household recycling centre and less over time. So even in Manchester, at the, the Renew Hub I mentioned before that we run um, on behalf of the Greater Manchester Combined Authority, we're seeing, and our the, the partnership that we have with the Social Enterprise Recycling Lives who, who manage and deal with the electrical pair side because they've got the skills around it, conversation for later in the, in the discussion, they're seeing fewer and fewer appliances come through as well. And there's probably a whole heap of reasons for that, cost of living crisis and uh, that we have, you know, that's an international challenge. Um, but also it is about that accessibility and movement. You know, your average car isn't going to fit a, uh, a washing machine in the back of it. So actually someone being able to get it down to us is is a, is a challenge in itself. So you often see them being collected by a bulky household waste collection, uh, which is where mm -hmm. a van turns up and someone takes it away for you. But often those items then get left out on the street or in an alleyway, which means as soon as it rains, you're putting a whole heap of additional damage on that item. Mm. Gets collected again. Who's uh, who's got the, who's got the dog on? Is it one of us? Oh, it's you, Sarah. So um, rang a doorbell as soon as I logged on. Oh, sorry. <laughs> on the G's. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, yeah, I think position. that's absolutely right. And actually, um, just a specific question from from our Australian audience, Sarah, for you. Um, and you may or may not know this, but why does Suez not have reuse and repair repair hubs in Australia? Do you know whether that's something they're looking at? I know it's something we're talking about on a, on a global perspective. So uh, we, you know, the, the hub that we have here in the UK is is the first one that we we have here in the UK. So it's you know it's a it's a new concept. You know it's been in place for just over eighteen months now. So you know it's it's still relatively new in terms of those sorts of networks. So I'm sure it's coming to uh, Suez in Australia very soon. And okay, so it's, like is it a trial, Sarah, or? You know, no, no, it... it's very much it's part of the network. So the right. so in Greater Manchester, we run twenty of these household waste recycling centres on behalf of the local authority. Um, three of them have shops, so that um, uh, the public can come and purchase items that have been you know brought down to the to those centres. We deemed a recyclable or reusable. They all come to that Renew Hub. We check them all to make sure that they are safe in terms of the electricals. They are PAT tested so that they, you know, they mm. meet the requirements to make sure that they are safe. So there's a confidence in that process that they have been checked. Uh, and then they're sent out to one of those three shops. There's a network there that's going on. So it's the, the scale of Manchester helps to inform and support that, that hub in terms of economic and impact as well. Because um, mm. you know, having all those things uh, weighed up as an important part of that process. Yeah, so you've touched on the issue of scale there, which was obviously linked to cost, um, et cetera, et cetera. And thank you to everyone who's making comments in the chat. If you have got a question, can you pop it in the Q&A? Because that comes up on a separate panel and then we haven't got to, um, you know, sift through the chat. Uh, but do, you know, do, do carry on with those because we will, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be coming back to that chat and actually be able to, to look at it post webinar as well. Um, okay, so we've talked about accessibility, we talked about cost. And actually, Sarah, you touched on something there around the social angle. So maybe before we dive into the specifics of, of things like spare parts and the other things, you know, I'm always wondering when the tipping point's going to happen. So we've been talking about repair for a very long time, you know, uh, and the, particularly in the UK, and I don't know, Belinda, if you've got... Um, experience that you can share from Australia but we've been trying a lot of things around reuse it always seems to fall on the um, social enterprise sector or the charity sector and yeah it just it just strikes me that it's not commercially viable okay and it just seems to be struggling on and on and on and on um linked to that we've now got cost of living crisis and we're now seeing you know quite shocking figures around appliance poverty so those of you on the call that are not familiar but Appliance poverty is where people are living without key household appliances. So maybe a fridge, a cooker, a washing machine, those sorts of things. It's going to link to furniture poverty, but specifically around appliances. So, again, I'll come back to you, Sarah, because I feel like you're seeing, you know, uh, the general public turning up 
at these at the, at the renew center um how you know how can repair help something like appliance poverty how do we get around this issue of it not being commercially viable you know how are you making it viable i'd, I'd love to know so yes i guess there's a few questions within that so sorry in terms of <laughs> unpeel those layers go and unpick it yeah so so in terms of making it commercially viable i, I think there's it's one of those that we could probably have a whole session just talking about the commercial mm. viability around it. You know, the way that we make it work in the services we provide, is we build it into the contract. So we build it into a contract with a local authority so that we either when it's new or during that contract. And that happens in a, in a number of, of ways. You know, so we make sure that we've got a clear uh, business model. Um, but what we don't do, we don't see reuse as something that's hugely profit making. So sewers is not sitting there going, ah, oh, this is you know the entire business model of the future. Mm. At the same time, we think it should, not just for us, but for the whole um, reuse and repair movement, because the only way we're going to make this the norm is if businesses of all shapes and sizes, from you know small individual repair all the way through to you know Beco and you know the manufacturers, it all becomes part of uh, you know business models and everything in between uh, is if people can make a viable living out of it so there has mm. to be um there has to be that rectification in the system there's obviously a number of mechanisms to do that VAT I'm sure is you know um is obviously a key one in the UK perspective but we've also got to make the new products more expensive because repair has got to be the cheaper option in order to write that ship but then we've also got to consider the social side which comes back to the other part of your question Emma which is you know how does the social impact link around this and can we rely on social enterprises and volunteers absolutely not social enterprises bring that additional layer of social impact by doing what they do um, so I think they have a really important role to play so for example recycling lives in Manchester um, they that whole social enterprise is based around reducing reoffending rates when when people come out of prison that's their whole purpose and they do that through waste um, they handle materials but they also do a lot of repair and they're increasingly doing that because they see that obviously this broad multifaceted business that they are becoming and but they they have that purpose is is what's driving their business mm. and it also means they can have a bigger impact because they've got the networks they've got the skills um because you know when you are trying to reduce reoffending rates it's not just about giving someone the opportunity to come and learn some new skills or to uh, to earn some money which is what they do by coming to the hub they spend eight weeks learning how to repair electricals they get paid for doing so so they've got that start of a 10 but they also need a lot of support you know, they've, mm. they go through this huge transition in their lives and they need extra support, which as sewers, you know, we could do so much, but recycling lives are so much better place to do that, to have the money. Interesting. Yeah. So there's there's um, a number of layers of this, which really um, build that, mm. in, that picture that comes with reuse and repair. Um, and they all need to come together. And there's no one silver bullet, I think, coming mm. up to your original question. I'm going to answer all three. There's no sil uh, silver bullets about all of these areas pushing forward and yes we you know we all want it to go bigger and faster than it is at the moment but all pushing in the right direction is continually pushing that ball up the hill mm. and what i like about that is where the commercial model may fail when we look at it in a very traditional sense what what you're doing there sarah is you're saying well actually if we if we include things like social impact which has a economic an, an economic value particularly the reoffending rates, if we were to start to put a number to that, suddenly it does stack up. Okay, so it's maybe one of these uh, lovely win-win areas that actually needs a kind of more societal response to say, you know, we do need community repair to do certain elements and that may need support. We do need um, the waste sector to step up we do need manufacturers to, to support and there's this like I can sort of feel like there's lots of spokes to the wheel. Absolutely. Because th those who have just tried to do it themselves seem to, um, other than on a very small local scale, seem to uh, become a bit unstuck. Sarah, I'm just going to um, come back to you just in terms of the Renew Centre. And because Glenn's asked a question, is there an app that exists for people to search for repair? Um, and Glenn, I'm not sure where you are, but um, in the UK, is there an app that people can... Use? I don't think there is, but I think that really comes back oh. to that accessibility point. So there are some really great directories. So Wales has a really fantastic repair directory, um, oh. which is worth looking up. Uh, but we, uh, you see them in bits and pieces under local authorities, but it's one where mm. you think we're really missing a trick 
and that's probably you know it's not just the case in the UK I'm sure that it's the same for others other countries where you know we need to get repair moving that further forward is you, we want things we need things to be as easy as buying new so it's not just about cost it's about all the behaviors that come with it so Glenn you, I think you've absolutely hit the nail on the head you know if we can go in click on an app and go oh I need my washing machine repaired you know someone's turning up at two o'clock the next day to come and have a look at it and it comes from you know all the skilled repairers you've got in the area that's going to make it so much more accessible you know roughly how much it's going to cost depending on the issue they might be able to do some self-diagnostics over the over the app wow suddenly great vision sarah great vision you know if we you can get your shopping delivered in 40 minutes from amazon right (laughs) but but you try and find someone to mention you know to get a repair done you might have to travel over two bridges as belinda was saying uh yeah great okay thank you for that and thanks to everybody james has just shared the link that I think, Sarah, you just mentioned about the Welsh Repair Directory, so that's a really good place to start. But something for me and and um, Andrew and probably Sarah as well, I know you guys uh, liaise with DEFRA and at UK policy level. You know, do we, do we need to start pushing this button around uh, national repair being a national thing? Um, any thoughts on that, Andrew? Has that come up in any conversations? Um, I think the challenge is... Um... It is who decides who's a, a professional and competent repairer um, because it, it would be good to have a, a directory absolutely support that um, and you can go on the manufacturer's site and you can arrange a repair but when it comes to an independent um, repairer in the UK if it's a gas appliance you have to be an accredited um, repairer you have to be gas mm-hmm. safe accredited we don't have any similar sort of accreditation um for electrical repairer repairers in the UK, although there is an argument that that says that electrical appliances are potentially as dangerous as gas appliances if they're not repaired correctly. Um, uh, And there is no appetite in government for having a similar sort of register. So as I said, I I think that's Mm -hmm. where it falls down. It's who decides who's going, you know, who does a good job um, and is you know is is able to go on that register and and who isn't um Mm. in terms of the right to repair legislation the government has referred to professional uh repairers but they've not they've chosen not to define what a professional repairer is they've left it to individual manufacturers to decide determine that and the, the danger with that is we'll all determine something slightly different and we will all be for understandable reasons very very cautious about who we're Mm. directing our customers to go to. Mm. Okay, so that's really interesting. We're just starting to broach this skills issue and also the safety issue. And interesting here, Artie is saying in India, the repair culture is huge. So if anyone's got any good examples from India or other countries where repair is flourishing, you know, um, uh, I guess formally or or informally, that would be really, really good to share. Uh, because, because perhaps we're talking mainly here about a formal route, right? A formal route of repair. Yet we know that a lot of people have got a fixer in their family. You know, my dad is one. That when anything breaks, that's that's the first port of call. So should we just talk quickly then about community repair? And Val, you were saying you're you're fairly close to that in Australia, and I know we've got uh karen here from mendit in australia as well so shouldn't we just allow people to repair their own devices isn't that the answer belinda oh it's it like uh, depending in nirvana i think in in front of me um in a perfect situation yeah i definitely think um you know if you could just order the part fix it yourself and be done with it that would be really nice but i think all the peripheral issues around that have come flooding into my flooding into my mind the safety um the yeah sort of the assurance of the work yeah so i'm just i don't know i feel like that's sort of a that's a big dream um i know mobile phones i know we're talking about large electrical appliances but mobile phones there's a lot more promise in that space um, so, yeah, we do have a lot of repair cafes around Australia. We are, we are good at problem solving and kind of getting on with it and just figuring out a way. But I've always had a bit of a vexed kind of feeling about it because you see all these like 
frankly, like legends and volunteers. Like I've only heard of one library in Australia that pays um, repairers. Mm. And so you sort of see the community picking up the slack where, you know, it really should be sort of spread across the whole system. There should be responsibility and accountability, I think, in every part of the value chain. Um, so, yeah, I think also with the, I know you were talking about like the tipping point as well. There's There has been a shift. Interestingly, the latest sort of um, survey that's being quoted around the, well, the Australian public's feelings around repair, uh, Sarah, no offence, but Veolia actually commissioned it, which I thought was quite interesting. And with the cost of, so I think like many countries around the world, um, yeah, we have cost of living challenges at the moment, and that's really driving interest and awareness around repair. And so, yeah, I think yeah. that coupled with that, coupled with Australia committing to transitioning to a circular economy by 2030, no one's really sure what that means, but it's <laughs> it's good. It's not, you know, let's let's yeah. aim high. Um, yeah, I think some pieces will, will come together. Yeah, and it, it kind of strikes me that, you know, it's 2023, everything's online, you can get something to your door within half an hour. And Val, you mentioned it, people are problem solvers. Um, so are we just going to do it anyway, you know, in spite of uh, the manufacturers, maybe in spite of policy? So is there a danger there that we, you know, that, that the horse will bolt? Um, yeah, so I think yeah. sometimes there's also this pride and celebration. Like if you, the times I fix something myself at home, it's like, yes, oh my God, I did it. Like I, I, it's really empowering and it's actually really joyful when you can just do that yourself. Um, yeah. So I think again, you know, there's probably opportunity, you know, to make it something that's actually like almost like a bit of a competition um, and yeah, almost like sort of that little trophy, like, hey, mm -hmm. I didn't have to go out to the, the shops yeah. or I didn't have to get a repair person because I You're did it You're right. Myself. Everyone loves that. It's like getting a bargain or something, isn't it? Um, I'm yeah. I'm going to come straight to Andrew. So, you know, Jeff has put in the chat that he's fixed his uh, oven using YouTube. And, you know, uh, should should Jeff be doing that, Andrew? Is that Does that worry you? Um, I think. It's Jeff's oven. It's entirely down to him how what how what he chooses to do in terms of repair it, uh, repairing it. And we're not against it. And actually, you know, parts for all our products are are available um, through parts distributors. We don't restrict our parts in any way. Um, and I, I, you know, if, if consumers want to repair their own, then that's fine. I, I think where we probably have more of a concern is around those who perhaps aren't competent or able to fix stuff or or you know um who are doing it for other people because then okay. it's amongst you know it's it's the the most vulnerable in society who um who will suffer as a result of that so you know i think hmm. what people choose to do is absolutely their choice with their own product i think there is a genuine concern around as i said those who are repairing on behalf of others and charging them for that service um and there is you know there's also a question about what we do as as manufacturers if we think people are likely to put themselves at harm by mm -hmm. repairing themselves repairing products themselves and you know, i've worked on manufacturers technical helplines i have spoken to people who are adamant that they can repair their own product um and yeah it's clearly confident from uh, obvious from me talking to them that they're not in any way competent to do that um, and that puts them at risk. Mm. What are the risks, Andrew, from, um, from taking the back off your oven or your washing machine? Um, the most common risk is, is generally, I think, that people don't unplug them, um, take the top off and then put the hand on something. Um, and because most large appliances are earth, you've then got um, a path um, from the live to the earth which passes straight through your body and quite often that passes straight through your heart because it goes from one half one hand to the other uh, and that's fatal and there are plenty of documented cases where um, people have died 
then they haven't even started repairing it. Just taken the top off, put their hand on the top of the washing machine to have a look inside, uh, and and have subsequently, um, you know, been electrocuted. Wow. Okay. I think it's important to know that. You know, I've been in the round circular economy for thirty years. I'm probably stupid enough to do that. <laughs> Right. Just because I might not think at the time. Now, as it is, I don't, you know, I've got a fixer in the family, but I think there's a real thing there. You think your competence is maybe higher than it is or you just have an accident. Right. You just forget to unplug yep. it. Or you forget to put the part back that's really important or you, you know, and, and going on to Jeff's point, I'm glad to hear, Jeff, that your oven hasn't blown up yet and you obviously didn't electrocute yourself, which is brilliant. Um, but he did say maybe there's a role here for more education even things like AI, you know, if, and come back to my point, if people are going to do it anyway, should we be protecting them more? Should we be providing them with more information? You know, what's the role of the manufacturer there, Andrew? Do you think? I think, I think James has actually just made a really, really important point, um, which, which bears repeating, which is, I think there are effectively three groups of people. There are those people who will never look to repair the appliance themselves. They'll look at it and go, this isn't for me. I will get a professional in. The other end of the spectrum, there is those who will give it a go because they will believe they're, they're competent and they almost certainly are competent to, to do it themselves or at least carry out an investigation to try and establish fault. There's a group in the middle who aren't quite sure. And the danger with providing them with information is it gives them confidence to have a go and in many cases will make them overconfident to have a go without really understanding the risks. Um, so perhaps to, to use a, a slightly different example, anybody who's got um, an electric lawnmower or hedge clippers or, or that type of device, it would be really clear in the instructions, plug your, your hedge trimmers, whatever, into an RCD socket, because then if you cut through the cable, it cuts the power immediately um and you won't you know you, you're not at risk then from picking up the cable and touching the bare wires if you go to a professional repairer they'll use exactly that sort of device either in the workshop they'll carry one with them they'll use it mm -hmm. but they're not the sort of thing that a consumer will necessarily have for themselves and it's certainly not something that i think many consumers will think i'll just plug my washing machine into that before i take the top off no, that's point. where the risk comes um and that comes from you know, in many cases, people thinking they might just have a look um, mm. and they'll see a video and think, oh, well, it looks easy on the video. And I've seen some of these videos and they do make them look really easy. Um, and uh, they end up putting themselves at risk. And, and, you know, for all of us, none of us want to see that happen, whatever our mm. perspective is on on consumers doing their own repairs. Brilliant. OK, so, yeah, I'm very aware that, you know, well, the world moves on and um you know, I fix it have been, you know, globally very progressive in terms of gadgets and getting people to mend those. And, you know, when I'm faced with a screen, my child's iPhone, £130 to replace the screen, I'm probably going to have a go, you know. <laughs> uh, so, so that is the world we live in. And I think we need to uh, be really aware of that. And, and thanks, James, for, the, for that comment. Um, I think, Karen, there was a comment there from, from Australia, but I can't find it at the moment about they're not being recorded any recorded deaths, at least in, in the five years of, of a report that was was issued. Um, just quickly, do we need to know this stuff? You know, like, do we need more data on this to inform both sides of the conversation? Sarah, is this something that you've looked into in you, you know, any of your research? So, or, so we yeah, it does a repair. We've looked into it. We haven't looked into repair specifically, but we look at the whole reuse and repair picture. You know, we know mm -hmm. when you look at household waste recycling centres, you know, we we estimate, you know, there's 35 and a half thousand items of all shapes and sizes, not just large electricals, you know, go, that could be reused that are going into containers every day just in the UK. You know, it's 15 million every year. 35,000 a day? A day, yeah. And we think that's conservative from, from our estimates. Now, that's um, a stat we need to know about, yeah. Wow. So, um, you know, that's 15 million every year, you know, and that's just the UK, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, what we've, what we haven't got is 
any central reporting in terms of what is being repaired. So we have no idea what our baseline is or what, you know, whether things are going up or down. We can see some trends. So, for example, Repair Week is an annual initiative run by Re London in, in London and actually had its first outing in Manchester this year. And they're seeing the numbers of events, number of organisations getting involved, number of people coming along, going up year on year. So we're seeing those trends. That's great. Um, but what we don't know is, is that translating into more items being fixed, less items going in the bin, um, fewer uh, calls mm -hmm. to helplines like Andrew's, you know, at, at Beckos. We, you know, there's there's all there's there's some really interesting pieces of research out there. So if there's any students that be at masters or PhDs uh, anytime soon, then uh, we probably can think of a whole. We have a student things. exactly saying that in the chat, so Sarah. So do get in touch with Sarah if you're uh, if you're keen on that. There was someone said they're doing a dissertation on repair. So thanks for that uh, offer. Yes, yeah, so absolutely. And uh, I think I think that was Emily, wasn't it? And Emily was our intern at Suez, so she's had a good ah, uh, good year with us to learn all about it. So uh, yeah, Emily, let's let's keep chatting um, on that one. But I think I think the other thing is because. Because we haven't got that emphasis at the policy level, there isn't that emphasis on reporting. Um, and I know you mentioned DEFRA before. Um, mm. um, one of the key cruxes actually in driving some of this change is more treasury. Because mm. actually that drives more of the economics. And it comes back to the point around actually if we can get the economics to stack up, mm. then we can, I think that's a key unlocker in that system. Um, mm. And treasury at the moment with the conversations we're certainly having with them um, uh, is that, you know, they just they're just not getting it. They just don't see it. They're like, if it doesn't make us money, we just, just don't know. And they can't see how this is going to make them money. They, they don't see that the 40,000 uh, repairers that we're going to need here in the UK to get the system going. Again, we think that's a conservative number based all across the UK. They don't see the economic impact of that. They don't wow. see how we'll keep goods and services in use for longer. And actually the benefit that brings to householders, particularly those experiencing um appliance mm -hmm. poverty as you're saying i mean you know someone with a without an oven it's going to cost them just over two thousand pounds more every year in takeaways and microwave meals that's a huge amount of money for anybody let alone someone who is in a really difficult financial position in their lives so they, they don't see all of that um and i think mm -hmm. there's there's a real challenge if we get treasury on board they're probably the most powerful department in the uk government um and if we can get them on board then you know there's there's a real political momentum that we could potentially uh drive which also comes back to that data that's point true. So yeah get, get so it's, it, I, I love that Sarah thank you for bringing that it's because I think we are we want to talk about what the crux is and we almost need to align and rather than you know the the um the community sector kind of having to wave the flag and go hang on a minute we want right to repair and you know it feels to me that we need to uh, create some stronger partnerships with industry across community across social enterprise across sectors um maybe to lobby you know and to bring this to bring this both nationally make this nationally important and you're right it's economically important so you know Bell was saying if we can move to a circular economy it's the same in the UK we can't do that without a repair infrastructure we just you know, we just we're just sort of stuck um I'm conscious of time and I wanted to come on to two things one is spare parts which comes up a lot a lot of people um asking about spare parts so Andrew you said briefly that spare parts are available yeah why, why do consumers keep saying that spare parts are an issue I don't know <laughs> this is the honest answer Tell I don't me know in the chat, why do people say spare I parts think, are an I issue? think a lot of it possibly is because people um lump all manufacturers in together and for certain product categories it may be harder to get spare okay. parts if you want spare parts for a PlayStation 5 you've probably got no chance if you right. want if you want spare no. parts for a becco washing machine they are freely available freely available? Yeah. not free well, freely yeah. available <laughs> God, you know. oh that would be the day wouldn't it if they were freely available uh yeah and and james again hit on the chat and said it works for higher value things like mountain bikes and cars and antiques and that sort of thing but i think spares availability of spares i know when i've got had spares um for my fridge trying to find the right model number trying to sift through the millions of catalogs and things uh and too much variation different sizing that sort of thing so is there a role here for you know better design around this assembly and spare parts i mean you must have thousands of spare parts andrew for, for all your different products we we hold over two hundred thousand spare parts in our warehouse 
Um, and our warehouse is not the total of what comes into the UK. Um, there's a there's a big chunk goes to spare parts distributors. Actually, they take more than 50% of the spare parts that come into the UK. So half a million parts of Beko wow. parts are available in the UK at, at any one time, probably across maybe um, 25,000 different lines. Um, I think just to, because you mentioned about um, repairability and disassembly, mm -hmm. um, and there were there were some questions in the in the chat that I was going to perhaps touch on really really briefly um, in the uh, in the Q and A. So um, thoughts on design for disassembly. Um, a lot of focus on government at the moment is on design for disassembly end of life, um, but whether or not that is a benefit involves really manufacturers like us talking to companies like Suez and those who, who who recycle appliances to make sure that we have a proper circular economy and that if we design them to be easier to take apart, um, uh, that there's a benefit to doing that. It's not just going up in a crusher. Mm. Um, but in terms of design for disassembly for repair, I'd argue our products are designed for disassembly for repair. We do um, probably in the region of 200,000 repairs a year on our appliances. Um, uh, so we're sending a lot of engineers out to repair a lot of products. It's not in our interest to design them, not to be easy to take um... apart. It's not, I don't think, an issue about design of disassembly. It's about familiarity with the product um, and the fact that we train our engineers on how to take our products apart. But they're not, you know, having said that, if you look at any washing machine, whatever the brand, it's probably designed in pretty much the same way. Um, really? Okay. And then um, there was there was a question on um, uh, directing consumers to long life appliances and which ones to purchase uh, and manufacturers building, uh, producing longer life and repairable products. Our products are repairable. Um, and in terms of longer life, the product will keep going for as long as the consumer wants it. But it might mean they have to repair it. Uh, and then it becomes a decision for the consumer as to whether or not they want to repair it. Mm. Um but you know, a product will probably keep going for as long as the consumer wants. When you look at what goes through Suez or goes through a recycling company, good chunk of that still works. Um, again, it's something we don't tend to talk about. Um, I've been to one recycling plant, given everybody else has had a look and decided it's reached the end of life, they can still pull out 20% of that um, and fix it and put it back into a second, third, fourth life. Yeah, great, thanks, Andrew. Um, so just, Belle, I wanted to come to you just in terms of the Australian view. Uh, I think you said before we met that you're sort of following here. You feel like Australia is, you know, looking at the rest of the world and uh, and learning. And, and actually a couple of interesting comments in, in the chat here is about um, uh, OEM parts being expensive. And Karen says in Australia they get donor parts uh, or parts from China. Um you know, have you got have you got any experience about around this area of availability of spare parts and and what needs to happen? Yeah, I think that um, that's a a big issue, and it's also coupled with if you sort of look at the recent history of Australia, all of we had so much manufacturing in the eighties, like when I was growing up, and before that, and so much of it has been moved offshore. However, at the moment, a lot of it's being onshored again um, in response, you know, knowing that we need to keep materials here domestically and recirculate them. So I do wonder if those things coupled, well, things are sort of going to turn the full circle. Um, but, yeah, spare parts, just honestly, uh, the number of people, the number of times, the number of incidences of um electrical appliances, fridges, dryers. Um, I know we haven't talked about consumption much, but even in a lot of the apartment buildings um, that are built new, it's stipulated that you have to have a dryer in your apartment. Like it's, so you, whether you like it or not, you know, you, you have this appliance even if you don't want it. So that's sort of part of, I think that's part of the issue as well, but I know we're short on time. Mm, yeah, no, I see, I see. So... Um, so many nice stats so, uh, here coming through. Go go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, I just, just wanted to add two really quick points. I'm really conscious of time. Just to, no, uh, you're fine. We can go around. over by a couple of minutes. It's fine. Awesome. Um, so in, in terms of um, accessibility of parts, I think one of the challenges we have in kind of the UK and the EU is that the right to repair legislation was 
um, updated in 2021, but it still means that manufacturers have two years to put their parts uh, available for reuse and repairers. Obviously, Becco are bucking that trend, and obviously they're you know they're they're the good guys in this. But that, as you know, Andrew pointed out with some of those products, that's not necessarily a case for all manufacturers. So there's there's a case for that legis legislative change at the same time. And equally, some of those parts are only made available to professional repairers depending on the scale of it as well. The other challenge that we see is around the compatibility of parts as well. Um, mm -hmm. uh, is, you know, so Andrew talking about using spare parts in, in different, uh, using spare parts to obviously repair other items. In bikes, for example, we can, you know, a bike that isn't suitable for repair, we can use those component parts quite easily in other models where it's relevant to. That's not as easy in large electrical appliances. Um, now, obviously there are, you know, you couldn't use a 10-year-old a washing machine to repair a two-year-old washing machine, for example. Yeah. But if you've got similar models, the parts aren't always compatible. So some of the feedback I'm getting, and that might not be the case for Becco, and Andrew might tell me differently. Um, but that's uh, that's also a challenge. You know, you need a very specific spare part. Uh, compatibility would help to, uh, you know, even that plane field and make it a simpler process as well. Yeah, and it, it, in the spirit of circular economy, you know, standardization and modularization, modularization, you know, is a thing. And it seems to me, going back to what work needs to be done here, then there needs to be, uh, you know, more collaboration in terms of, well, actually, if it's designed in a certain way, that doesn't help us further down the line. Or if it's, you know, access to things are, are causing blockages, it sort of needs almost the helicopter kind of view. Andrew, did you want to quickly come back on that? Um, yeah, I, I guess two points. One is um, in terms no. of availability of spare parts, of course, we're the industry leader, but I think if you go to any reputable brand, um, they will they will have spare parts available through some route because it's in their interest. Their their you know their business is going to be based on customer loyalty, uh, and people be able to, able to access um, spare parts or whatever to do whatever they want with their product with with that brand's name on the front. I think in terms of um, moving spare parts. You know, the difference between our products and the bike is our products use electricity and there is a safety implication um, and our products are tested to um, standards for safety um, using the spare parts that have been used to design that product. Mm -hmm. Once you start using something else in it, you take it outside the confines of that safety testing uh, and any safety certification on that appliance is actually no longer valid. Um, uh, and then finally, from a manufacturer's perspective, I can see there are benefits from uh, from the people that think there are benefits from us. You're using the same components, component standardization. The challenge and the risk is where that goes wrong. And we've suffered from this, where you use one component across your entire range. Then you find that component is not terribly reliable. Uh, and actually, you have a huge problem at that point. So that's one of the reasons that we will will tend to use different components in different products. Mm. It helps us limit the risk. Okay, so diversity is actually yeah. helps you strengthen that, Andrew. Okay, yeah. um, thank you, everyone. We're coming to the top of the top of the hour. I am just going to ask my panel uh, uh, to sum up in in one or two words. Um, who should act first on this? You know, where you see this triangle with community, policy, uh, and industry, right? It's similar across all sustainability um, factors, isn't it? You know, who's going to move first? Linda, what's your perspective in Australia? Uh, look, from a systems point of view, it has to be the federal government. We've we've got a uh, we had an so you asked for two words. We have an inquiry. We have the recommendations. They need to be acted on. Brilliant. So you're looking at policy, Bell. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. I think I'd concur in the UK. I think we've already got first movers in terms of community repair and others like Andrew who are doing a fantastic job. We need policy to set a direction and get everyone moving together. Okay, great. Andrew, who do you think um, needs to move? I, I'm, I'm going to disagree with Bell because in the UK, I don't think it's about policy. I, I think it's about um closer engagement between manufacturers uh and others whether or not that's recyclers or community repairers or all of us if if we're going to be circular then we have to talk around the same table that's where it comes from with all the people in the circle yeah, yeah. what a great way to wrap up thank you andrew and uh that went really quick as ever uh but thanks to my panel uh bell and andrew and sarah 
And thank you to the 60 odd people who joined us um, and the 50 odd who are still here. And thank you for all of your questions. Um, a few things were shared in the chat. Um, do uh, maybe comment on LinkedIn if you need to get hold of any of us. I'm sure you can find us all on LinkedIn and we will peruse the questions after. And if there are any that we can um, helpfully um, uh, solve, we will get in touch with you through through Be Waste Wise. Uh, but that's um, that's the top of the hour, guys. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Akanksha, over to you to close. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Emma. And uh, thank you to our esteemed panel for taking time out and sharing your knowledge and expertise. I can see there have been so many questions being posed and um, we, uh, because of the due shortage of time, we're not able to answer. But uh, we'll make sure that these questions are being sent across to the panel and they hopefully, like Andrew did it last time, uh, taking out time, uh, We'll be able to you know answer them and uh, send it across uh we are so happy that this particular uh, session had so much uh, uh pointers from the attendees and uh, so many uh, comments and so much information sending out so uh thank you all the attendees for uh, taking time out and being part of this discussion and as i mentioned that this webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded on our website soon and uh, you can uh, you know stay updated on our future events and you can subscribe to our newsletter and also follow us on social media thank you so much for uh, having us and thank you so much for taking time out and being part of such waste dialogues thank you thank you emma cool. thank you Sarah. thank you bye thanks thank everyone you. bye thank you